Hi, everyone. I'm State Representative Derek Slapp, and welcome to the uh, June edition of Derek and the District. I'm very pleased to, uh, we have two segments today. Our first segment is with uh, the Cates, Kate Weaver and Kate Martin, and uh, they are part of uh, the national group, um, Moms Demand Action, and this is about uh, sensible gun safety legislation. So we'll talk to them about uh, how the General Assembly did this past um, 2018 legislative session, um, their inspiration for being part of the group and what's next. And then in the second segment, we're going to talk to a local volunteer and representative of the AARP. And similar type of questions, of course, not focused on uh, gun safety, but on issues that really impact seniors. Uh, so thanks again for joining us, and we'll get right to it with um, Kate Martin and Kate Weaver. Thanks very much for coming on the show. Thank you Thanks. for having us, Derek. So uh, tell me first, if, um, if you would, about uh, this group and how you became involved in it. Sure. So the group is a national group, like you said, and it started in the wake of the Sandy Hook tragedy. Um, essentially, there was a woman who was living in Indiana at the time, a stay-at-home mom. She was um, watching this tragedy unfold in front of her on TV and was devastated. Didn't know what to do, how she could finally kind of get off the sidelines and get involved in the wake of all of this death and destruction. And so she started Googling to see if there was um, anything similar to like Mothers Against Drunk Driving, a right. real grassroots right. um, initiative. And she couldn't find anything. And so at that moment, um, her name is Shannon Watts, she created a Facebook page and she, um, basically put it out there, I wanna help create sensible gun laws and keep our children, families, and communities safe. And within instance, people were on that page, sure. liking it, sharing it, joining the movement. And from then to now, we have almost five million members nationwide. Wow. There's a chapter in each state. Um, in Connecticut, we've been in existence since right after the tragedy mm -hmm. at Sandy Hook. We have 14 local groups, including our own um, here in the Hartford area. Um, so the, the, the group essentially aims to pass common sense gun legislation, and mm -hmm. we've been very successful um, at the state level yep. um, across the country. So it's been really, really exciting. There's also an emphasis on changing the culture around gun safety as well. So we've done a lot of advocacy around certain corporations and businesses to help keep guns out of stores, out of certain restaurants and establishments. Um, as well as working um, to keep them just out of the hands of dangerous people. Um, right. Red flag laws are something we've worked on a lot in different states, which allows um, a family member or a police officer to uh, require somebody who they deemed dangerous to themselves or others to relinquish their guns um, pending a demonstration that they're safe to have the guns back. So it really is a holistic approach. Um, to gun, you know, the, the epidemic we have in this country. Yeah. On average, 96 people a day die from gun violence. In a typical year, over 13,000 people are dying. For everyone killed, there's two people injured. Um, so really, that's, that's what the group aims to do. So I personally got involved um, right after the Sandy Hook shooting. I was living yeah. in New York City at the time, did some work there. And um, I'm a mother of four okay. now, yeah. So I had um, three kids in two years, and I kind of fell out of um, the agreement with yeah. the group. And then um, the five-year anniversary of the Sandy Hook tragedy hit me really hard, personally. Yeah. My daughter was in first grade at Duffy. Yep. Um, I, the whole day, I just had this pit in my stomach and was feeling just so anxious and just sad thinking about, you know, what had happened just, you know, 50 miles down the road yeah. from where we live. And, um, you know, she got off the bus that day and I just had this like release, like, oh my God, I'm so happy she's home. Like that was so stressful. Mm. And um, I started looking around to see if the group existed here in Connecticut, if Moms Demand Action existed here in Connecticut. And I found out it did, but primarily in Southern Connecticut. Um, so I got in touch with some people and kind of said, what's going on in Hartford? Yeah. And they said, well, n you know, not much, but we would really like for there to be. Would you lead up right. a group? Bingo. So you had you And had so the I kind of said, all right, like, you know, what's the expectation? And it was like, oh, as little or much as you want, you know, not, not a huge yep. commitment. Um, there's not a ton going on right now. And that was five days before the Parkland shooting. Yeah. And so that changed everything. Of course. It yeah. really changed everything. Yeah. You so know. And you really have been a presence at the Capitol, both of you. Right. right? I mean, through, uh, through the entire process this past yeah. legislative session. Um, what about you? What, what inspired you to get uh, involved? 
So, I, I mean, to be honest, I got involved because Kate asked me to get involved. Okay. And um, I, I find a lot of inspiration in just the, the Moms Demand Action story. A woman just like us sitting in her home just feeling devastated over reading the news and feeling like she wanted to do something. And I think it, it just has this trickle-down effect where you look at someone who you didn't know had any of this um, – activist volunteerism in them and here they are doing amazing things to help with legislation to mm -hmm. help educate the public and then you raise your hand and say well I don't want to just sit here and do nothing either so I will do something and before you know it you're you're serving in these roles that you never imagined yourself in before either I mean and, and I feel like Everybody it serves as the inspiration for the next volunteer, and right. that's why since Parkland, our state chapter has grown by more than 3,000%. I mean, people are wow. just popping up, and I think it's a lot to do with just frustration in reading the news and feeling like, you know what, it's, it's time to actually start taking action. Yeah, and, and you know, I can say as a lawmaker, having citizen activists, it, it's so critical uh, because uh, there are some legislators on certain issues who they're going to champion the cause no matter what, right? Mm -hmm. Because they, you know, believe it in the core. And then there's others on any issue that they're going to kind of wait and see what their constituents say and what they what they hear from their constituents. Right? And if they don't hear anything, right, that that matters. Right. So I think on an issue like this, you know, there's a certain amount of votes in the general assembly on on these issues no matter what. But then there's a lot of people who, um, you know, hearing from their constituents, right, is really important. Um, so I give you a lot of credit. I mean, we see this on issues like um, water, for instance. There's right. you know, Save Our Water, and they've Absolutely. done really great things. And they kind of, if it's a relay race, you know, they, they hand the baton to us somewhere along along the race, right? And we pick it up and kind of get it over the finish line, but right. it, it wouldn't happen without you all. Um, and I, I think it's important to say that this is not about you know, some people, they, they see guns and legislation, they think it's taking guns away from people, and, and this is not what this no. is about, or getting rid of the Second Amendment, mm -hmm. or not allowing hunting, or things like this. It's really <clears throat> kind of, I do refer to, and I know you do too, as kind of common sense things Absolutely. that, you know, upwards of 80% of the population at least agree on, right? And, and why don't, this is a good, I think, transition into some of your priorities this legislative session. Right. So I could say, you know, nationally the priority is, like you said, um, background checks. You know, 97% of Americans in the wake of the Parkland shooting supported background checks on the sale of every gun. Right. And we don't have that nationally. And that's going to be, you know, a big emphasis for us. Um, about 22% um, percent of guns are exchanged um, through non-licensed dealers, and so that means no background check is happening on those gun sales. So that's a concern for our yep. group. Um, and then locally, so our priorities this year were, um, first was the bump stock bill. Right. So as most people are aware, you know, um, in November of last year, there was the shooting in Las Vegas. 58 people were killed, over 500 injured in the matter of 10 minutes. And this was because the shooter equipped 12 you know, assault style weapon, weapons with bump stocks. And so what bump stocks do is they simulate the rate of fire of a fully automatic weapon, of a machine gun, right. which we have already said as a country and as a state, we don't want. So what bump stocks, bump stocks do, it's a workaround to the law and it allows people to replicate that rate of fire. And so um, the legislation was proposed. We worked a lot with yep. Connecticut Against Gun Violence. They were critical, you know, in drafting this legislation and advocating for it, as right. well as Newtown Action Alliance. Yep. And so um, the, you know, the legislation was to ban bump stocks in Connecticut. It's, it's, uh, it right. passed, as you yeah. know, on Tuesday. Yep. We were thrilled. Um, but we were active and vocal at the Judiciary Committee back in March right. um, at the hearing for that. We testified on behalf. Uh, we've, we really flooded um, that lot, that uh, the room at the LOB with red shirts. You know, we had a lot of visibility there. Yeah. And between that date and then when the House voted last Tuesday um, in favor of the bill with bipartisan support, That's which right. we were thrilled That's about. Right. In both chambers. In both was, chambers, there was, there was bipartisan strong bipartisan support. support, almost three to one. Um, so that was really exciting for us. So that got passed last this past Tuesday yep. through the Senate, and um, we expect it to be on the governor's desk, you know, very shortly. Um, right. Do you want to talk about ghost guns? Um, yeah, and there's, so there's a second piece of legislation. Yeah. There mm -hmm. were some others, but really two main pieces, right? Bump stocks, check, 
we did it. And then yep. Ghost Guns, uh, a different story. Right? Yeah, so Ghost Guns, um, most of the general population doesn't know what that is, but if you want to learn more, you can go to ghostguns.com and basically it's a website and a series of websites that allows you to buy a gun online um, with no age requirement, no background check required. Um, the, the guns are unserialized. They're typically about 80% finished and they come with instructions on mm -hmm. how to uh, go to Home Depot, buy the last few pieces that you need. You can finish that gun at home and, and now you've got a gun and it, it's just a major loophole in um, the law right now that we would really like to close that loophole and we're hoping that um, it comes up again in the next session. Right. Well, I'll, I'll be supporting it, and I think you're right that it will come up again next session. Um, and this is really just about treating all uh, guns the same, right? right, in terms of background checks and in terms of having a serial number. So, right, right. Um, so it seems, you know, pretty basic. And I do think ultimately that we'll get um, bipartisan support for that bill. Uh, hopefully next year. Okay. Um, you have a couple events coming up. Do you want to highlight them, uh, either of you? Kind of yeah. tell us. Uh, yeah, so we we're have. really excited. We have a, a very busy June coming up. Um, June 2nd is National Wear Orange Day, and that's just um, a gun violence awareness campaign that happens across the country. Here in West Hartford, we're going to be um, participating in a walk to all 16 um, public schools in town, which is Great. about 15 miles. We have it mapped out. We've got um, a group of moms and mom supporters planning to walk with us. Um, we will be wearing orange. And as I said, we're just here to raise um, awareness for gun violence prevention. Um, the following weekend to celebrate West Hartford, we will have a table at the okay. event for anybody that would like to learn more, volunteer, find out when our next meeting is. Um, we, we have t-shirts there too. We Can people get t-shirts? Uh, we'll yeah. see. We hope to. We <laughs> hope to. Yeah. 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 Um, They're in high demand. Yeah. Yeah. Probably to get a fundraiser. We are going to be yeah. registering people to vote. Um, that's that's right. one of the big things we're focused on right now is the midterm elections and making sure um, people know who the gun sense candidates are. Um, and we also, uh, one of the things that we do at the table, apart from these, um, you know, these pieces of legislation and the, the big national mass mm -hmm. shootings that get a lot of press is every day people are dying from just unsecured firearms in sure. their homes. And that is um, becoming a much bigger focus for Moms Demand Action as well as just educating people on securing your firearms, especially if you have children in the house. Sure. Um, it's just one, one of the most senseless tragedies we read about on a regular basis. Yeah, it, is, it is heartbreaking. I mean, uh, any gun that is, but those especially are. Right. Really, yeah. Right. Um, so, all right. So we have uh, Celebrate West Hartford. We have The Walk. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. and what about yeah. if folks um, see this, whether it be on Facebook, the Internet, or um, on, on TV, and they want to get involved, and they're not at either of those two events? What's the good contact information for the group? So we have an email address that we set up for our group. It's okay. called Hartford Moms Demand Action at gmail.com. Okay. So that's Hartford Moms Demand Action at gmail.com. We'll have our next local group meeting. We've had three meetings here in the Hartford area. Oh, no, this will be our third. Right. And it's um, Wednesday, June 27th at 7 p.m. at Asylum Hill Church in Hartford. Okay. Um, and, and I do want to just reiterate one thing you said, Derek, because I really think this is important, which is, you know, we are... Um, we're mom-centric, but we're not mom-exclusive. So we do welcome right. all supporters of anybody who wants to get involved, um, you know, in pushing gotcha. gun safety. That's good, because I'm going to join you at the wall. <laughs> yeah, no, we would love it. We would right. love it. And also, um, like you said, we're not against the Second Amendment. We, we, we are for the Second Amendment. We are for gun safety. Yeah. And so, you know, I think people... Um, this can be a very partisan issue, a very polarizing issue, and we really do welcome anybody who's interested in learning more or getting involved. As long as you're interested in keeping people safe from gun violence, then you're welcome with us. Right. And just having a collaborative dialogue, I think, Absolutely. is Absolutely. Really important. Yeah. So great. Well, thank you. So Kate Martin, Kate Weaver, yeah. thrilled that you uh, are, you know, spending some uh, some time with me and helping to uh, educate uh, really everybody about this important issue. So thank you very much. Thank you, Derek. Thank you. Derek. Thank you. We'll take a quick break, and we'll be right back with the AARP.
Hi everyone and welcome back. I'm your state representative, Derek Slap, and this is a segment that we call Slap Salutes, just kind of an easy way to remember it. Uh, but really the point is to highlight a person, or in this case, uh, in addition, um, an organization that is really kind of going above and beyond and making a positive impact in our community. In this case, um, too, I want to introduce Tom Sennett. Tom is a uh, a local West Hartford resident lives just a few blocks from where we're uh, we're taping right now at, at Town Hall, and he is a volunteer with AARP, and he's been uh, a real presence uh, at the Capitol this past legislative session, advocating for seniors and in issues that are really important to the quality of life uh, for seniors in our community. So, Tom, thank you for coming in. It's My pleasure. Time. Thank you. So, really appreciate it. Um, what are some, uh, you know, before we get into the kind of specific uh, legislative items that you've been uh, pushing, and we can kind of do an assessment sure. as to how the General Assembly did, um, how come you got involved with AARP? Like, what was your personal kind of inspiration? Well, uh, my inspiration was the work that I did during my career. And that was to help people get to the point of, in uh, their life where they didn't have to work anymore. Right. Uh, I worked for a number of large financial organizations uh, here in Connecticut, worked largely with uh, corporate clients, and if I was successful in the work that I did with those clients, their people were able to enjoy secure retirements. Uh, retirement plans are a wonderful thing. The, the, the challenge is, is that only about half the people yeah. in the workforce have access to a workplace re retirement program. Someone I know from AARP knew my background and talked to me shortly after my, my retirement about the work that AARP was doing in Connecticut and indeed across the nation in support of these state-sponsored uh, retirement programs. Okay. And when I learned more about the nature of the program, really the elegant simplicity of it mm -hmm. and the solution that it offered to provide to a need that has been unmet by the private sector, I said, absolutely, I'd like to get involved. This, these are things like called State K, right? And there's some states that have set these things up. Right? They're called the, the, the uh, nomenclature that seems to be adopted uh, yep. in, in the, the uh, trade press is secure choice. Okay. And typically it's a, it's a Roth IRA or an IRA type structure that employees are enrolled in. Right. Okay, and we do not have that. We should say in Connecticut. I mean, in terms of uh, you know, we are in the program. process. We are right. in the process of implementing that. Right. Uh, my work with ARP has led to my appointment to the board that is charged with bringing up Connecticut's Secure Choice program, and we are hard hard at work at, at making that happen. Good. So one of the issues that I hear about all the time and just out in the community as a legislator is um, seniors are leaving. Seniors are leaving Connecticut. That it's. Um, it's too expensive and, um, you know, and that we need to make it, right, uh, it easier for folks to stay. Because a lot mm -hmm. of times I think seniors want to stay because they have their children or their grandchildren, right, are still here, but instead they're fleeing to other states. What's your assessment of that? Do you think, one, that that's, the mass exodus is true? And, and if so, what are some things that you think Connecticut can do to help retain our seniors? I think, I think certainly with, with peers of mine, there is consideration of that that, that has occurred. Um, I think one of the things that you have accomplished was phasing out uh, state taxation, Social Security. Right. I think that's going to help. Uh, I think more importantly, though, you know, people may want to move to Florida for a warmer climate or a different tax structure, but that's nice. But it's not the joy that you get from friends and family. Mm -hmm. And if if you lived here for a while, your friends are here, your family's here. I, th I think the most important thing that can be done is to assure us a, a vibrant economy in Connecticut so that uh, our children can find employment here and, and find meaningful work here. And, right. and do what you know my parents did with me and, and what I have done with my, my uh, family, which is to raise a family in a wonderful environment here in Connecticut. Right, West Hartford especially. Absolutely. Right? Yeah, and you did mention the uh, state income tax on Social Security. We um, are one of 14 states, I believe, I think that's the number, that, that did impose the state income tax on Social Security, and that the bill was passed last year, and I think next fiscal uh, it'll be implemented. So Congratulations yeah. on uh, well, making that happen. Thank you. I mean, it was a great, it was yeah. a team effort, as, as all these things have to be, right, to build consensus, and in, uh, in the, in the, that was in the bipartisan budget mm -hmm. uh, last year. Um, so what are some other 
priorities that you've been uh, advocating mm -hmm. for at the Capitol? And uh, give us your assessment, if you can, about how, how you think the General Assembly did this past Well, cycle. let me begin with, with some of the accomplishments of the, the General Assembly last year. Certainly a, a, important to the, the organization was the restoration of funding for Medicare and home health care. Yeah. Uh, I think we all know of either a family member or a friend that has required elder care. Uh, it's something that is in store for most of us at some point in our life. Uh, and I think that we all appreciate that when that does occur, the preferred course of care is for the individual to remain in their home right. for as long as they can. Right. Uh, it is also mo the most cost effective. Uh, it's, it's far cheaper mm -hmm. to, to keep someone in their home than to put them in a nursing home. Absolutely. So I think that the restoration of funding for that was a wise spend. Yes. You know, you, you spent money to save money. Uh, in accomplishing right. that. Right, I think about 25% of our annual budget for the state is Medicaid, so. Uh, it's, it's a huge amount. It's a huge yeah. amount, yeah, it's yeah. about $5 billion, right. so. Uh, another thing I, I think accomplishment was making sure something didn't happen, that was the deregulation of landlines. Mm -hmm. uh, there's about a million people that still use landlines here in Connecticut. You know, I, my children don't use landlines. We took uh, the landline out of my own home, but from a usage standpoint, it is predominantly elderly that use landlines. Uh, it's the poor and it's those that are in rural areas without you know, very good uh, right. cell, cell access. So it's one thing to figure out what's the path from here to the future. Uh, you know, there, there certainly could be a future without landlines. Right. But just to say, well, there's no longer any service requirements or any quality re requirements right. is not a logical way to go. Yeah, you know, and I should say that you and ARP played a critical role in stopping that legislation. So uh, as vice chair of the Energy Committee, I, it had to come through the Energy right. Committee, and there were those of us who were constantly trying to put the brakes on it and to say, time out, let's not do this. Um, but it can be lonely if there's, you know, a few of you. Uh, and Absolutely. We need the Army with us, and you guys were the Army, no yeah. doubt. Oh, great. Yeah. Uh, but I think there there's, can be a, a more rational right. and logical approach to, to making that transition, but uh, I think the legislation that was proposed was not the answer. Uh, I think another accomplishment was uh, uh, pay equity. Mm -hmm. um, and I, on two fronts, I, I think from a senior standpoint, Somebody that is late in their career that is either looking for a transition to do something else or perhaps has been downsized, they may have a significantly larger salary than, than somebody just entering the workforce. Right. Uh, they may be willing to work for less, but if the prospective employer is judging their potential cost on what they've been paid before, it's less likely that they're going to be offered the opportunity to do that work. Uh, the other side of the coin, you know, I have two, two daughters bright, capable daughters, and I want to make sure that uh, they have the same opportunity to earn the same amount as my bright, capable son right. if they're doing the same, uh, the same type of work. And right. I think the data has clearly shown that women in general get paid less than men mm -hmm. do they, through their male counterparts uh, for the, the, the same work. Yeah, so and, and congratulations so the, on that front. I think removing the, 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 the pay question, pay history question from the interview, it really takes that off the table. The, the employer has to, to judge and make an offer on the value of the work and what the value of that individual can, can make to the employer rather than what they've made in the past. Yeah, when I started pushing this legislation about two years ago, I looked at the statistics and saw that Connecticut ranked 46 in the country in terms of the amount of money that women lose on average, right, over the course of their careers. It was over half a million dollars. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, and I'd love to get your take on this, that that's one of the reasons if you look at the poverty rate for women who are over the age of 65, it's double that of men. Um, and that's one of the reasons, right? That's a Absolutely. lot of money. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and so the goal of that legislation, um, Tom, as you mentioned, is to eliminate what we call the salary anchor. So when you go from one job to the next to the next, um, if you're unpaid, if you're paid unfairly once, oftentimes that gets continued and the employer might say, well, I look at your salary, I'll give you another 10%, right? right? right. Which is kind of typical. So um, Connecticut uh, will be the fifth state in the country now to ban the pay history question. So if I can remember, it's California, Oregon, Massachusetts, and Delaware, and now us, and New York City as well. So on both the coasts, you can't essentially ask it anymore. 
Um, and uh, we, we did work, so you know, with the business community as well. So we had CBIA and large and small businesses come in and be part of the process. Mm -hmm. So I think that helped. So for fellow seniors as well as my children, thanks for uh, accomplishing that. Oh, oh absolutely. Mm -hmm. And AARP was at the table too, mm -hmm. so played a key role. So um, what, what else uh, would you, uh, as you look at kind of the scorecard of the General Assembly and the legislative session, would you look at and say, um, you know, this was either either a good job or maybe not? Because, you know, we don't get everything done that we should sometimes. Yeah, I, th those are the things that I, I thought I'd, I would uh, focus on in, in the, the discussion that we're having today. Certainly going forward, and I'm not so sure that these are controllable at the, the, the state level, but... Uh, certainly challenges that, that seniors face. One is the cost of, of drugs, right? Uh, prescription drugs. I did before this uh, uh, session with you, I was, I was just reading something where the, the uh, cost of Medicare drugs is something like 10 times the uh, amount of inflation recently. Right. So that's uh, really spiraling out of control. What to do with Social Security? What to do with, with, with Medicare? Uh, it may be at the federal question, but mm -hmm. certainly from a from a senior standpoint, there's the ability to address the impending uh, deficits, right. the, 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 the bankruptcy that, that's projected over the decades to come with small changes made today, mm -hmm. uh, but it doesn't seem as though anything's getting done. This is about uh, eligibility, things like that. Eligibility, right? the, 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 when people retire, the amount yep. that they get when they retire, what they contribute uh, to, to Social Security while they're still working. All of those are levers that can be pulled today to change the outcome the decades ahead. Right. And, and so, um, you know, when you're working on these issues, um, what kind of approach do you take in terms of uh, the, the, the long view and see kind of incremental change? Or are there, how, do you, how do you triage? What do you think the most, is, the most important issues versus things that it's okay to kind of nibble around the edges? I, th I think there's a balance of them. Yeah. There's the, the, the balance of the, the long issues as well as the short issues. I think you, you see that uh, down at the state capitol. You see the AARP volunteers show up in their, their red shirts. Mm -hmm. uh, but that also happens with uh, uh, con congressional meetings where, where either uh, the uh, congressional representatives or the, our representatives in the Senate are holding meetings in state. Certainly during the presidential run right. as candidates yeah. visited the state. People were showing up in their red shirts asking questions about these things and saying, what is your plan solution on these things? Right. And, you know, I've found, and I've only been serving really for two legislative sessions, so not even two full years, that um, it's we work best together when we really try to collaborate and not see people, whether it be in other parties or from other parts of the state, um, as other, you know, and try to find common ground. And so, um, and I know I, you all are part of that. I mean, you're a nonpartisan organization, mm -hmm. and so, so you're not Democratic or Republican or whatever, but you're really trying to bring people together. You're trying to find solutions. Yeah, I, I read um, recently, I was uh, uh, traveling out to Indiana, uh, and there was a description of Jerry Brown, the governor uh, of California and longtime uh, politician. Uh, he has something he describes as canoe politics. Have you ever heard of that no, philosophy? No, it's pretty no. cool. And he said, so if you're always paddling on the left, Right. You'll go you'll go in one circles. way, you'll go in a circle. Right. And if you're always paddling on the right, you'll go in a circle, too. If you go a little bit on the left and a little bit on the right, yep. you go straight. And that's kind of a right, a creative way, I think, of saying of, of trying to be collaborative mm -hmm. and, and uh, not so dogmatic that you can't see you know, both sides. Absolutely. So um, anything that I didn't ask you that you think is important to, to touch on, whether it be uh, legislation or priorities of AARP? That's a classic question. But the answer is going to be no. Okay, fair enough. I wanted to make sure we got everything yeah. in. I really appreciate no. your time. And it's been it's been a pleasure. Great, yeah. and your your counsel uh, as always, because you have a lot of really uh, great insights into retirement well, and you. security. Yeah. So, uh, that is Tom Sennett, West Hartford resident, volunteer with the AARP, and uh, thank you very much for spending uh, some time with us. Again, my name is State Representative Derek Slap, and you can contact me at my website. Um, Facebook, I'm the only Slap around, so easy to find, and it's Derek D E R E K dot slap slap at cga.ct.gov that's the email thanks again for watching i'll see you very soon so long